I welcome to, to, uh, to this um, talk, is probably the wrong term, to this workshop about the Overpass API. The idea is that you can use some, uh, <coughs> that you can use <laughs> some, uh, some at least of the basic features afterwards uh, directly without trying to get it through the wizard. And hopefully understand the principle how you can build up more complex queries. As I already have told you, there is a documentation. It's still work in progress. It's, it's just, I always thought, um, or more or less people thought that writing a documentation is just a thing I could do on a rainy wall, a weekend. Unfortunately, it's not that case. So, um, I expect it to be complete not before the end of the year. But uh, let's start with some, in, uh, some use cases. Um, that's one we haven't seen yet. Um, but I find it uh, very, very helpful also for practical purpose. It's showing uh, elements that are stacked vertical one over another. It's a problem that you usually have in a map that you cannot see if the things are just stacked vertically like you have in a shopping mall, railway station, um, university building, or so on. It's the closest building that has it taking here to the situation here. It's, um, this, this faculty here has no indoor mapping so far, but apparently the Pedagogische Hochschule has one. And they, uh, they concentrated on making a useful user interface, a nice presentation, and making it helpful. And they loaded off all the work with the database, keeping the data up to date, and so on, on the overpass by making a query each time when you open up this page. Then your browser makes in the background a, a query for the respective, um, up to the, for the respective uh, OpenStreetMap data that you need at that point to render indoor data, uh, to render the indoor data. Another example. Uh, uh, client-side rendered maps. For example, in this case, um, I just decided I want to like a map of uh, Essen, where we have often a biannual meeting from the local chapter of the German, uh, um, for the local German chapter of Foskis, the so-called Hegwinkent uh, of uh, Foskis. And uh, that's quite easy. For example, to to print a primitive version of a uh, annual um, poster of a map. You just download it, uh, or Mapperative does it for you, and then in Mapperative you can do all the rendering and you can change the rules and you can get feedback on changing the rules of the rendering within rather a couple of minutes or seconds and not like with the full rendering tool chain where you would have to reload the data and rebuild the database and so on. Or so another case is where you just want to fetch a couple of specific data. This is um, a part of the um, primary root network of Iceland, which uh, represented a journey of, uh, of us. And the thing we, will mess, uh, we are mostly concerned with this day is uh, to analyze the data, uh, data interactively with the, uh, with the Overpass Turbo. This is a tool designed by Martin, who was, uh, sh uh, had given a short interview in, uh, in the talk before. And um, it's, in fact, the most user-friendly way to interact with the database, to interact with the Overpass API. And I'm very happy I has done it because I have just no idea of a UI. And it would have got awful. So um, there will be a documentation on this. It's currently at the moment, it's not yet, it's only written in German, it's not yet written in English. But this will give a short introduction, and I think this thing has also documentation on itself, and to just give an idea how it works. You <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. You specify a specific, oh, I should do it here and with the mouse. You specify a, oh no, it's not getting into. What else do we have? Things that are long and impressive. Um, ah, okay. Okay. 
I'm not sure because it's now, um, in my case, it's on the screen, but... Ah, okay. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Okay, so... Um, so what you do is to see this, uh, this interface where you can put here into the text field a text like this, for example, give me all the restaurants that belong to the area, which is uh, left out here. For that re reason, this query wouldn't work. And uh, give me the output. Then this thing, once you, pr uh, once you press the run button here, the interface sends a request uh, to the Overpass API. The Overpass API is uh, a pair of servers that's uh, some, uh, standing somewhere here in, uh, in Eastern Germany in a small, uh, at a commercial um, provider, but it's open source, so you can have any number of copies you want. And uh, it fetches, in fact, it fetches every minute uh, the uh, diffs of the OSM, so it's always up to date, up to a couple of minutes. So it gets the requests. It applies the request on the API, and requires to replace, uh, it applies the request on the database and then uh, returns the result, the results from applying the request on the database. In this case, a couple of fictional symbolic results. And Overpass Turbo will then draw these results on a map for you if the results are. Huh? Uh, no. Okay, it was scheduled for 60 minutes. If it were a lightning talk, you were relatively generous, but <laughs> sorry for the confusion. Okay, to be short on the data model, um, there are nodes, ways, and relations, and I assume all of you know the data model. So, how many people do know how, or oh, not how many, who knows how areas are working in detail in OpenStreetMap? Okay, that's not a clear majority, so I'll drop a couple of words on this. You should imagine, and it's, um, it's an ongoing discussion since about 10, 10 years, I think, <coughs> that there is a proper data <laughs> data type for areas. But there is no proper data type for areas in OpenStreetMap. There are two ways how areas are usually modeled. One is to model it in a closed way. You have a way, like the usual OSM way, and then you make the first, point, uh, make the first node the same as the last node. And that way you indicate that it's an area. Depending on the other tagging, it can be already an area if it's just closed. Or you should make it explicit with setting an extra tag area equals yes. But basically, if you are trying to evaluate this, you have to search for ways that are closed and that have a certain setting of uh, taggings if you want to get an area that is more or less a way. A similar thing for a relay, or not similar, but uh, there are even uh, a second way to model areas that are as relations. The reason for that is that one very uh, popular application for areas is to have the boundaries of the world. And the boundaries, uh, boundaries of the world are uh, such that, beside from the sea boundaries, you have always uh, two adjacent areas to a boundary. They are always uh, hitting at the boundary. So uh, all these boundary relations share the boundary uh, with, so share the boundary way with another. So the actually boundary of the area is uh, is defined by multiple ways, which we unfortunately do not see here. But it's not a problem because we specified that we anyway don't want it to see it. But uh, 
you can see it in overpass Turbo if it's uh, purple, and that means that if you are going to search for areas, you have to consider both cases, basically. A couple of words about things that do not exist in the data model. There is no segregation by themes, by layers. That's a concept that has been well known to all the GIS professionals that you sort out data in layers and uh, that, pre that predates even the digital age. There had been times where people have uh, worked with large transparent uh, layers, films. They have put one after another and they, so they could uh, show a map with uh, putting the right films on top of each other. And, uh, but it turned out that um, OSM worked better without. Essentially, OSM tried and did work. And why? I think the main reason is everyday life notions do overlap. So a trivial example is uh, if you would ask a question like, where could I get coffee or cake? Then it could be available at bakeries, cafes, restaurants, supermarkets. Depends on the time of the day. And more specific aspects, what uh, plays a role? Similar uh, for minor streets, it's not that clear what their primary purpose, whether they are important for uh, the cycleway network and so should get always uh, considered as potential or real cycleways, uh, whether you are mostly interested in having paved areas and so on. And uh, the third example, cash maybe. A, so if you would have uh, split it out into layers, you would uh, have pre-specialized the data and a lot of people would always have, uh, have been feeling like second-class citizens because their specific problem would be, spread about, uh, would be spread over several layers, telling them implicitly that their problem is less important. So um, I think it's one of the important things of OpenStreetMap that, you, um, that this never has taken place. So nobody has um, the impression that uh, their problem is of second uh, only of second order of importance. It's just like everybody thinks it's a little bit chaotic. But uh, you cannot expect that there's something like layers. So what you should do is, um, if you really want to build an application, not just do a single query, you should uh, search for matching tags. There are many more tools than uh, Overpass to do this. And in fact, Overpass uh, is not the right tool to do that. The starts on the wiki, you should always cross-check with tag info. Tag info is a very important tool because it makes a statistic on how often tags are used. And uh, so if you have a tag that's uh, used a million times, uh, then it's probably a tag that everybody uh, who's a little, bit, um, over, uh, a little bit experienced in OpenStreetMap knows about. If you have a tag that, uh, that is used uh, 10 times, then either you have something that is very, very, very specific and unlikely to be worth building an application on top of it, or you have something that, uh, that's uh, just a small minority of people is uh, proposing, so it's not helpful to pursue that road further. So it makes sense to always look for the statistics to whether tech has really support or not. It makes even more sense to survey the corresponding data, whether it looks like the data you expect. Could easily happen. The, la the latest thing that came around is, um, is uh, Martin told me that you can't get sausages uh, as a butcher in Italy, because butchers do not do uh, sausages in Italy. And uh, that would be totally surprising for a German, where you always could uh, get sausages at the um, At the, uh, at the butcher. There are also a ton of other cases. Um, usually the most important and painful case are uh, cycleways because too few people they, uh, think about uh, cyclists. And not so much too f uh, few mappers. And instead, there are many engaged mappers. But cycleways take very different forms in reality across different countries, including countries where it's simply not, not feasible to do cycling Kate mentioned uh, Tanzania this morning. So it may happen that actually it's not possible to do cycling if you want to make a cycling map. Or it could be 
necessary to understand what the local community thinks is the right way to, to uh, show cycle maps. And for that reason, it's always, it's never be a one button uh, solution. It's always uh, you need to, to have an idea to survey the corresponding data and then to restate state initially and then restate your data model. And really go out, tell people that for me a cycleway is a residential road or an unclassified road or an explicit cycleway or a path unless it's explicitly um, marked as not accessible for bikes and then start to rethink whether you want or do not want to use primary, secondary, tertiaries, more important streets, and so on. And really explicitly state it for you, write it down, and then check with the, document or with the available documentation uh, and with the corresponding data whether it makes sense or whether you are leaving out important streets. By the way, if you want to read in parallel, this, this chapter is already complete, the data model of OpenStreetMap. What also does not exist is normalization or categorification like uh, in uh, Wikipedia categories. Well, essentially, um, well, it's my talk, so okay, and, uh, I can say bad things. It never worked in SQL anyway. I think I have never seen a non-trivial non example of a relational database which was correctly uh, normalized. In textbooks probably, uh, not in any production system. But that's, that's a different thing. Um, the normalization, um, or the idea is that you could just um, define very clearly which attributes can exist, which can't exist, and have a um, data model when end, will usually end up with either a data model, model that will brush off a lot of the details, or with a data model that has the same complexity, uh, complexity than the data, which is useless for basically that point. Because if the data model is uh, as huge as the data, then it's not abstracting anything. So we have freedom instead of fixed notions. And we leave it up to the user. Have cycleways along the street the same name or of the street or not? Both variants exist. There exists uh, local communities which have the name of the of the cycleway on the street, and others do not. Does belong to a railway station, the associated bus station, the place before the station stop the station, and so uh, and so on. Just imagine. Depends a little bit on the point of view. Depends also on the uh, on the. Um, Railway station, you may, oh, sorry. On the railway station, you may have in head as your prime example. On uh, if it's a large one with a shopping center, shopping mall inside, and it would all um, would likely even include the uh, the parking garage into the railway station because it's important for the shopping mall or so on. And if your basic example is a small railway station that's close to. Uh, close to a factory building or a supermarket with a dis uh, detached park, uh, parking space and you would refuse to include the parking space with the railway station and so on. So, why the, so because, for the, because of this, because we could never have agreed on how to take these things, there, is, there are no fixed uh, rules about all these things. Instead, a lot of, uh, a big role uh, plays string equality for example, between a street or all the addresses of a street, if you want to get all the addresses of a street, then you search for all objects that have this tag here, address street, set to the given name, and that will give you all the yellow objects that all have an address uh, where the street name is the name of the street. So it's really all about string equality. It's not as... Uh, Surprising as you may think, even if you were going to identify us, you are still comparing strings. It's just you are comparing fancy strings. So we try to have state with uh, directly under human understandable strings instead. So string equality plays a central role in identifying which objects belong together in OpenStreetMap because it's easy to check on the ground. So we start now with the real examples. I've let you wait long enough. 
This is the URL for the tool. And um, I would like to ask you to enter um, NVR in name equals Heidelberg out center into the, uh, into the text field like I've done before, I've done here. Just the text is, uh, the text is bigger here repeated for your convenience. And if you press run, you should get uh, you should get results. Roughly the result shown here. Now we'll have a short uh, look of what's uh, contributing to the query here. The first thing you should notice is um, do you have to press the uh, This is not a reminder to, my, uh, uh, to myself. You have to uh, click after the run. You have to click the, uh, the, the glasses here because you need it to, um, to zoom on the real data. In the beginning, you will see a section of Rome, not this one. And uh, so you need this to check on all the, uh, to, to zoom on all the results. Because Heidelberg is quite popular, you find uh, results for objects named Heidelberg all around the world. And um, so it's zooming out to almost uh, worldwide, or exactly worldwide. So what this consists of is uh, there are two lines which uh, constitute so-called statements. This one, the first line with the first statement, um, constitutes uh, uh, cares to, to select all the data you want to see. And this one, the second line, um, the second statement, um, actually um, outputs them to or outputs them back to you. So the uh, what uh, what we want uh, what we have stated here is we want nodes, ways, and relations. That is why it's n for nodes, v for ways, r for relations, and we are. And we have to tell it if we would just stop here, then we would get all the data in the world. That's not helpful. So, um, so we have to, to narrow down this, and an effective way of narrowing down it is to, um, to tell it which tag to use, and this is the syntax with two uh, brackets and the equal sign. This comes from a thing that is depending on, uh, on your background is very obscure or very obvious, uh, a thing called XPath. And um, it's just convention that you have these brackets and the equal sign, and before the equal sign, the name, and after the equal sign, the, the value. You can and should basically put always uh, both paths in quotation marks, but uh, overpass will accept it without quotation marks if there are no special characters in it. It's just going to fail if there are special characters in it. We'll have an example later on. And that's the first thing. We have told it here. We want all objects um, that fulfill the condition that they have a name tag with value Heidelberg. And these are exactly these 72 nodes and 23 ways and eight relations. And then we tell it out center. Out center makes only one coordinate per object. That is in particular, if you want to peek at the data, where it is, how much it is, it's often the best choice because you have um, still a decent data size. You can crash down your, uh, your browser by asking for the wrong things otherwise. And uh, so you can specify multiple values here. Okay, now a second was an uh, example. We now want to get all the streets here, uh, all the streets here around that are named Neuenheimer Feld. Same syntax as before. We search for a tag 
with name in Neuenheimer Feld, uh, with uh, name, uh, with key and value. Uh, um, uh, for historic reasons, I had uh, the full names of the types, node, way, and relation in the beginning. And people ask, uh, ask as an extra feature to get a shortcut for all three types together. And so there's no order in NVR. There's also, uh, had been quite obvious, but uh, it's, it's always a developer who doesn't see the obvious thing. The people demand further that there are also NV and VRs. So I'm going to add that. I'm not sure whether it's wise to have single letters here because uh, I want to support the query language long time, very long time. And so uh, one, till, uh, one letter shortcuts are uh, used here. I cannot use them for anything else. So I'm a little bit reluctant to that. But um, anyway, you can short, uh, shorten relation to rel. So node has four letters. It's the longest uh, type specification, uh, speci specifier. And way and rel have, only, um, have anyway also only three letters. So I think it's, uh, it's really a design choice uh, plus some history. OK, it's faster because it's only ways. And oh, I showed it so, uh, shows the result, but the, re the result's already here. And uh, now we could start to ask for a second tag in parallel. You have seen we had beforehand uh, results from all of the uh, all of the uh, all of the region here, because a lot of parts of these are named in Neuenheimer Feld, including the cycleways and footways. And now we are adding a second tag by just uh, writing it uh, one after another. It's just that simple. It's also borrowed from XPath, the syntax, and also the uh, historical uh, interface XAPI had this already. It's just, uh, so it's, it's always, if you, you can write as many conditions as you want, one after another, and they are always connected by and. We are only finding objects that are ways and that have a name tag with value im Neuenheimer Feld and have a um, highway which equals to residential. So I'll, um, I'll come back to, uh, to the case of OR a little bit later. And again, we use our center to get the result uh, here. We could now go to, to a little bit that's more, uh, that looks uh, prettier because we know we get relatively few results and uh, so it's not overloading the browser if we get the full geometry. Ah, very are pretty things. You can always pretty print. That is, white space doesn't play a role. The thing that controls the end of, um, of statements are the colons. So that's often helpful and, and to, to make the queries more human readable. So as proposed, we get the, instead of the uh, one point per object, we now get uh, the full way geometry. And here these are line strings because this is a way. And how do I do it? I write geom here. The tricky thing about Geom is it's uh, already much more data with ways. For nodes, it doesn't may, uh, play a role whether you have center or Geom. For, um, for ways, it's already five to, uh, three to five times more data. For, OK, yeah, that was the uh, prime example. For relations, this one takes only some seconds. We are again asking for our center. You just ask for all the relations that have um, that have. Uh, uh, well, oh, sorry, we are just asking for again for one uh, one coordinate per relation that is found. And in fact, you will find three relations if you run the query. 
Uh, the third one is, uh, is before Africa. That's just a bug in the software. The, the relation does exist. The relation does not have any, um, any geometrical data. And uh, the software does still deliver a coordinate and guesses if there's no geometrical data, the coordinate should be zero, zero. But I'll fix that. But the more important point is um, you should keep in, in mind, although we could uh, think if we ask for France, it's only one big, but only one object. In fact, we get three. And in this case, it's not that horrible because one of the three objects has no geometry. The other one is a small hamlet in Ireland uh, and only one proper uh, boundary exists. Um, the situation is wor worse, for example, for Germany. If you try it out, it's, it's horribly slow because uh, there are three boundaries of Germany in the database. I don't know why precisely. Um, one is uh, without the um, coastal area. One is the maritime boundary, which is uh, 12 nautic miles into the sea. And uh, I don't know at the moment what's the third one. But the result is that uh, if you try this uh, and replace it with Germany, or the next one more precisely, this one is already slow with uh, France because it's going to uh, Four megabyte now so doesn't sound much uh, in modern times, but uh, you should consider that your browser is going to render it, or more better, it's not necessarily rendering it, but it may just crash. And um, if you try this with Germany, it's even 20 megabytes. So that is the reason why I strongly encourage you to always try out with OutCenter first because then you get an idea of how many results you have. There's also one, uh, one level more course. It's called OutCount. And start this only if you have uh, reason to assume that you can cope with the amount of data that's uh, going to be returned. There's also that the server resources are shared among, uh, amongst all the people using the service. These are at the moment around uh, 30 to 40,000 people a day. And uh, so as a fair service to them, if you load, uh, download too often uh, per, let's say per hour, uh, large uh, amounts of data, then the server may, uh, may time out you for, for a couple of minutes, usually not more than 15 to 20 minutes. And for that reason, you should uh, try to avoid to download uh, much data unless you know what you do. And for that reason, I always uh, suggest you start with OutCenter. Even if there are many examples um, out, in the, out in the wild that uh, do use uh, bigger output modes. There are a couple of the output modes that are actually found in the wild. I encourage you to go to the documentation. No, I'm sorry for the little break. No, I encourage you to go to the documentation and understand what they all do. The one-liners are uh, distinct output modes, like the one I have already mentioned, uh, geom, center, count. There are more. For example, uh, meter does uh, expose, potentially expose uh, personal data, uh, which would be uh, susceptible to the GDPR. And for that reason, I'm going to change soon this uh, towards the mode where the username and the change it number is emitted from out meter and there will be a separate uh, output mode out attribute. And this is how all these mode, uh, modes come to, come to life. Afterwards, out attribute would be fine uh, without violating GDPR and if you want to use out meter, you would have uh, a GDPR clear reason to, to do so. And uh, like that, the other modes come stem from the data model. What you usually have is um, you are dealing with ways and relations, and ways and relations do not have geometry. They have references. 
And um, so in the beginning, classically, on, uh, at outside overpass, you have to often have to break down this uh, to the nodes beforehand. And so what you do is um, you ask overpass to deliver all the nodes along with the ways and the relations and keep the re references in the ways and the relations such that the program that is finally consuming the data can again sort it so that it can work with this. Sounds a little bit complicated. It's the way how is, uh, historically the things are. And uh, many pieces of software are still that way, that they need this um, outdated way of having the geometry on separate nodes and doing the sorting again on itself. And for these reasons, all these output modes exist that uh, cater for the needs of the various um, programs out there in the wild uh, to be able to digest the data. There are more details in the documentation and which program needs which one. As I've mentioned, I suggest to first try without center just to get an idea where the points are. Okay, let's now get officially to... No, we have been at multiple texts, however, there's only one at the moment. Well, wrong headline, sorry. Um, we want to filter by areas. And uh, we now have the problem. We want to tell it here, like we have before. We search for ways that have the name Berliner Straße. And because there are many, many Berliner Straßes in Germany, it's a popular name. It's just uh, maybe because it's Berlin is the capital of Germany. Um, you want to, to reduce this only to a certain area, say Heidelberg. And to do this, we combine, as before, two filters. So we tell it here, you want all the ways that have, a name, uh, that have the name Berliner Straße, attack with the name Berliner Straße, attack with key, name, and value Berliner Straße, sorry, and uh, that are inside an area. And now this thing, must know which area to take. And it does so from keeping the result of the previous statement. You could imagine like every statement assigns to, uh, <coughs> assigns to a variable named underscore its results. And this statement is able to uh, read, uh, this filter is able to read from underscore its results. So what we do is we ask first for all areas that have the name Heidelberg and then we ask for all ways that have the name Berliner Straße and are within the area Heidelberg and then we, put, uh, then we output them. That's the result. Or if you try it out, you will find answers that, that, that this isn't the result. The result is... Uh, Rather more, uh, it's just telling what I have told you. This one is executed first. After this first statement, we have the area in the, um, uh, we, have the we have the areas, you remember, these are around 200 ways, nodes, and relations. And the result, then um, it seconds executes this, where this filter uses all these, uh, the 200 areas that have been known before. And then this one is uh, executed third. And um, this is a real result. And this is a good idea to, to get back to the cycle I have mentioned in the beginning of uh, making the query, understanding the result, uh, sharpening your understanding of uh, sharpening your model. You have to understand to debug which areas have caused the results just in a couple of villages north of Heidelberg. The result we want is uh, this one here down. And these ones are just uh, stray results you basically didn't intend to get. And it turns out there's a relation um, with, this, with these tags, amongst others, name Heidelberg, and the type is boundary uh, political. Uh, political election, 
And that's the thing that can happen in OpenStreetMap. There's just an object, uh, object you never have thought of. In this case, this extra uh, electoral boundary, in case of the German boundary, as mentioned, uh, um, the extra boundary for the, uh, for the landmass. And in the case of France, the extra object uh, with, with the so-called superrelation, where the geometry is one level of interaction uh, farther. And we have to deal with them. First of all, we have found this by another filter. What have we done? We have again asked for all areas. Then we have asked for, this is a special filter, pivot, that asks, that uses the results to return the objects that have, have been responsible for creating these areas. And then finally it's output with geometry because you want to see where the objects are. So, you have three ways to come out of this problem. That's quite frequent. So, I'll tell you all this, uh, shortly all the three. One is um, to, to restrict the initial set of areas. Which, uh, with this one, we are down to much, much less um, Heidelberg areas because the boundary electric is, uh, we are only asking for um, official boundaries, administrative. Okay, I will not go into detail of this one, but the documentation is complete here. I encourage you to read it there. The second approach is to use a bounding box. It's of general interest um, because there are many cases where you want to use the bounding box directly. For example, if you use a wizard, you almost always end up with a bounding box. In this case, we have again taken the original areas, but we have told it here, we want, in addition, we want those ways that have a tag uh, with key highway and a value one off track or residential. And a second, uh, that are inside uh, one of the given areas. And third, that are within this explicitly specified bounding box. It's in the order south, west, north, east. So this is the latitude, this is the longitude, this is the, la the second latitude, which is always bigger than the first one. This is the second longitude, which is almost always bigger than the first one, except you are intentionally um, crossing the anti-meridian. And for comparison, the same uh, query just without the area. So you see the bounding box is much larger to the left. And uh, have I lost the third approach? Looks like. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and this is a very important convenience feature of Overpass Turbo, and by the way, also of JOSM and probably many other tools, that are these, uh, this is this must, uh, mustache syntax, these double, um, double curly bra brackets, and the special key B box. Overpass Turbo uh, will uh, pass the query for whether such a substring with uh, double curly braces and a keyword exists, and then replace it by whatever it has stored for this. In the case of B-Box, it's just the um, bounding box of the, uh, of, the, um, of the area you actually see at the moment. So, I thank you for your attention. Do you have questions? Yes? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this extremely interesting introduction into the Overpass API. Um, can you talk a little bit about the different use cases uh, and you know how you find, as, as much as you know, um, what kind of institutions or entities use um, 
the overpass API just to get some ideas about all the cool stuff that one can do? Um, that's a very difficult question depending on uh, which level you, you ask uh, to. I would have to go through the log files to, to get an idea who is really querying the database. From that on, you don't know uh, what the people are doing. Um, I think obviously there's a lot of use in, uh, within the project and that's the intent which I would say retrospectively it's, it's the most helpful case because um, it's just you had these discussions and one of the points was that uh, you had the, the, the wizards that were able to deliver the data whether a problem actually exists and that has much clamped down you still have, uh, unfortunately, I think it's not as obvious as it was intended, this query language, I'm sorry for that, but I think much more people can now just say, oh, they have typed this, uh, this query and post the link to it. And so in many of the discussions, whether this is a strange piece of data or so, just people just send around the link and then other people can look at precisely the data intended. And how it looks at the moment when they, when they check it, or even if they want it, it's the moment when it was discovered, depending on how the query was stated. And I think that's the most important use case. And um, then there are a couple of uh, question, uh, requests from, uh, from companies from time to time, but I don't know what they actually do with it. Um, I personally very, uh, like very, uh, very much the, the open level up, um, the indoor editor. They at least uh, existed at least to large scale uh, competitors uh, or projects with similar goals, also to present indoor with a, with a or with, with emphasis on railway stations and so indoor mapping was a large thing where really people put up this away with they want to do, um, do tile rendering on the large scale and do this micro rendering on the small scale when you get down to, to a specific region where you want to, to tell further details and um, that has been a large case and then this family of what I have mentioned um, these overlay maps, uh, I'm not sure how popular they are really. It's not that difficult to make one. That's more like one or two. Uh, once we have made the first three, the fourth one is probably within five minutes. And, uh, and so there exist many, but I don't think many of them have that many uh, users. So um, one is the, the unter I think I had a, do I had the Unterkunftskarte or do I had I had the, the street lamps in the um, in the introduction. The street lamps had it even made into the local newspaper, and that really had an influence because um, the local city council thought that it was these historic street lamps. They are powered with gas. And they thought that they just were a very expensive piece of scrap and wanted to replace it with electric uh, street lamps. And uh, then an engaged local mapper came, made such an overlay map, nice dim background, and uh, presented the, lab, the lamps in the different colors, showing, look, you have a real city-wide um, point of interest I don't know the word, attraction. You have really a city-wide attraction of historic street lamps. They form a network. They embrace the, all of the uh, old town. Do you really want to scrap that? And then afterward, uh, the, the local newspaper picked up the story, and in the end, the lamps are still there to, uh, today. The, the city council managed to, to restore them instead of scrap them. So uh, that's probably an extreme example, but you see how it goes. It's, um, you are able without forming a large organization to, uh, to share the duties along the way. Uh, the, the heavy lifting of the data is done by the overpass. The making a nice presentation is done by the enthusiastic mapper. And then the impact on the general public is more happening with, uh, with politics. And it's going even that far. But I think that's another large group of use cases that exist that people use, um, use these uh, these overlay maps, 
one of the, the three things that makes the, uh, the most uh, load are um, an app that, uh, that asks for the local speed limits. So I think there must be an app outside, don't know which one or how many. Or was I, yeah. Uh, could be, could be, but yeah, could be, but Street Complete uh, does usually use um, a helpful um, user uh, user agent. So why should they use a no user agent for one specific kind of query? It doesn't make sense. So um, so there's probably an app outside or multiple that are um, that are that are asking constantly for speed limits. So I don't know whether it's real time because I do not make any time guarantees. I do not make even a guarantee that the service is, uh, will stay, um, will, will stay up, they will, I will, that I will keep up time, this, uh, keep up the server. Although it's funded for another two years by the German uh, local chapter Foskis and uh, and it hasn't had any downtimes in the last two years, so uh, there are pretty good chances. Um, but, well, this app uses this, this for, uh, for high speeds. And we also have somebody who's uh, asking for, looks like um, fire response teams infrastructure in, in Switzerland. And if there are some activities going on with uh, with the Swiss fire departments uh, using OSM, and they are quite happy with it. I assume it's uh, it's related to this. It's also that's very fascinating that the rescue brigades of a very high developed uh, country resort to OSM and even resort rather to a time to to a service with no time guarantees, uh, at least at the second level. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't suggest that in any way. I could imagine there are plans to, to migrate to an infrastructure that's better under their control. This has happened a couple of times. Um, a couple of uh, companies have asked, how, uh, asked for help how to uh, set up their, their own proper instances. And of course, I don't know what they do with this, but uh, that the purpose is most useful um, overlay maps and uh, and getting all data at a certain spot and so on. But that's the range of applications. Okay, are there further questions? Yes? Yeah, just give the microphone there, please. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I was just curious, could you speak or give a little more information on the removal of the meta out? Sorry? You, you talked about removing meta out to be in compliance with the German uh, GDPR laws, and, but you mentioned something else yeah. about still being able ah, to ah, export that information. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What's, uh, what's happening is um, there had been an extensive discussion about in OpenStreetMap about what to do about the GDPR. And one of the things is that um, the usernames and user IDs and change IDs are considered personal data. You can discuss this, but uh, they are considered that way. And uh, that's the whole in the whole European Union and uh, Given of the impact of the European Union, it's, it's in fact it's all uh, worldwide, so it's, it's not as German specific. Um, and uh, one one of one things of my on my to do list is to at least make it simple for people to get exactly the non personal data. And for that reason, there is a plan to to clamp down out meter to only the non personal data. That means to, to skip the username and the, um, and the change ID and the user ID from the data returned and instead have a new call out attribution that's including this, date, uh, this data such that in the end um, you can ask when you have 
proven that you are an OSM user, then you can still ask for all of the data because then it's considered leg uh, legitimate. The idea behind the GDPR is that if you have a good reason to use the data, then you can do so. But if you haven't, then you shouldn't do that. The basic idea is to avoid that people sit on large data piles that they have collected just in case that. And, um, and so they, um, sorry. And so they, they, forbidden, they have forbidden except, uh, explicitly that. So um, instead, you can have the data if you have a good reason to have this. And if you are an OSM user and want to understand another OSM user's activity, then this is always a good reason. So then you can use the out attrib call. And in the other case, you could only use, continue to use the out meter call. It's, in fact, it's a non-backwards compatibility, but I would prefer that way. It's not yet done. I would prefer that way to, to ensure that all the examples out there in the wild still work without uh, logging in. I don't know whether this met your question. Okay. Further questions? Thank you for the talk in the first place. Uh, second, I have a question um, concerning the backend of Overpass API. Yep. And I wonder how the data of the world, uh, the OpenStreetMap data, is yep. represented and how you query uh, this 60 gigabytes of data. Uh, this depends on which level of detail I could go down. Apparently, I. Huh? Sorry? 30 minutes, um, that's quite a lot. But um, let's sort out a couple of things. Um, doing database layout is in the end that you have a probability model which data is likely to be asked for um, incident incidentally. That is, um, you can speed up things if you know beforehand that it's likely if, uh, if you know a user is asking for A, is also asking for B. And um, that was the main selling point of the overpass, that, uh, that I represent the data in the back end, um, or represent that in the geometrical order it is on the world. So I do a, a kind of, uh, of that curve. And um, well, uh, if I really would use 30 minutes, I would, uh, wouldn't avoid to use, I would avoid to use the name Artry because it's quite a way away from Artry, but Artry is, is, is the right idea for the ways because you cannot have the ways on one coordinate. But for nodes, it's really, it's, it's buckets of, uh, of their local uh, place. And um, for ways, we are just um, having a kind of tiled Artry that, that turned out to be good enough just make uh, tiles of a certain size. It's uh, 600 by 400 meters about or so. It comes quite naturally from uh, when you try to, to make an index from the data then um, and, and skip the lower bits, uh, the, lower, the lower bits, then um, and keep the upper bits, then you get blocks of certain size uh, quite naturally. And uh, then I have... Uh, then I have these tiles where the ways are stored in. And so again, if you ask for something with always in, uh, in Heidelberg or so, it's going through the, uh, the bucket, the very, uh, the smallest bucket, the 600 by 400 meters, or several of them because they are all belong somewhat to Heidelberg. Then to fewer, but still some one level uh, above, and some, uh, still some one level f further down and so on. That's what's basically happening, sorting the objects by their geography uh, the best way I know and uh, then uh, and then retrieving them blockwise. Essentially avoiding all the, uh, the indexing because really what you have different from SQL, 
we have uh, expect a more or less random access patterns where do not expect that that it's a that it's an often used case that you have two all the objects between two index points are requested on on the same time uh, because it's not expected to be ha happening very often uh, this is not optimized for so um, I do optimize for this because it's very frequent, uh, frequent that people ask for uh, give me all the data of this or even if you have give me all the data of this with a certain search criteria. If you just get through some thousand object scanning that's, that's, a, that's a matter of microseconds, it's so fast, it's fast enough. So it's all about these buckets in the end. You could say that it's technically that it's obsolete with the arrival of uh, SSDs, but then again, um, there is still a difference between uh, a reading and writing SSD and reading and writing from RAM. So there is still some some leeway to to gain by having blocks. But uh, I have no idea um, how much it really is. But in the end. It's, uh, it's got faster with SSDs. It's still uh, not so that somebody came around with an SQL implementation. It's just so much faster that everybody would prefer that one. So I think the trick still, still somewhat helps. Uh, another question, sorry. Um, I think last I checked on the OSM wiki, there's a few instances of overpass, and in fact, on Turbo or even in JAWSM, yep. you can select which which endpoint you want to you want to hit um, to retrieve data. I th is it true that the main overpass instance is the only one that serves up data at a point in time, attic data, or uh, are there other? Um, I think for attic data, yes, it could be the case. Um, the Russian instance came back to life recently, right. but it's not serving attic data. This is for no apparent reason. This is mostly because I have to trust. Uh, I think the Russians have uh, remade the old system, but they had been very good at emulating the old system. I, uh, I think probably in the end it's just uh, it's, it's a VM or it's very similar. So I need to trust really that I could put more load on the system, uh, whether it's fast enough. And uh, so it's not doing attic data yet. And uh, all the other instances aren't on, under my direct control, so I cannot force them to do attic data. I think, yeah, it's the only instance doing attic data. And once we have the split between um, GDPR relevant data and GDPR irrelevant data, I think there's probably even more impact to, to restrict to GDPR free data or GDPR non-affected data and leave out this comparably tiny piece of uh, user data um, out and for that case even parts of the attic data, not all, because you can have a history of an object without looking at the usernames. Just have to, to rethink the thing there is. Uh, it's interesting to get back a deleted object. It's interesting to get back uh, the old geometry of an object if something has gone wrong. And for that, you don't need to, uh, to know the username. And uh, for that reason, um, once, uh, once the cut is implemented clearly, I think it's probably even easier to have attic data. But I think no other instance has it has at the moment, yes. Additionally, surrounding attic data, I think in the past few months there's been some issues with uh, server load from users running attic queries. Um, I noticed a, an instance specifically where it was possible to retrieve all roads within a given country like using like a geocoded area search, s such as like return all roads at a point in time in Ghana, but the same query wasn't runnable or executable over Iceland for even a small subset of roads like a residential, give me all residential highways at a point in time. So are there, like, do you know of the performance issues surrounding that and are there plans to improve um, the I know there have been performance issues. My response to this was to make the code more efficient and that's currently in the pipeline and uh, it hasn't been finished before the conference, and it's not a good idea to roll out a, a version during a conference, so it's going live after the conference. 
probably with a couple of days uh, delay. And um, on local tests, it's about 30 to 50 percent faster. And it's probably just enough relief to, to get the, uh, the productive instances back on track. By the way, one of the productive instances isn't even under overload, uh, the LZ4. That's, that's pretty fine. But uh, that's probably another discussion for, uh, for how it is implemented. Uh, we wanted to fit on the SSD, and um, it's, uh, it had already surpassed the magical uh, 400 uh, gigabyte uh, limit, which is convenient for having normal data warehouse uh, SSDs with some security margin to the 480 that are popular. And um, so we started to compress things um, with, uh, on the one hand with, uh, uh, with GZIP and on the other hand with, uh, with LZ4. And um, GZIP is more efficient in compressing, uh, but LZ4 is much faster. And uh, the LZ4 version at the moment is borderline big. Uh, it's approaching rather quickly the 400 uh, gig limit when I run again into problems with the, uh, with the size of the SSDs of the server. So I'm not sure I can keep it up and for that reason there's a second one that's, uh, that's uh, running the, uh, the still running the GZIP algorithm. That's because it's the database is smaller. And uh, I hope with, the re, uh, with changing to the, to the new version that uh, I can uh, update both to the LZ4 uh, version because it's then both uh, quicker. So I really expect that uh, the performance issues will stay away for a year or so uh, once the new version is out. Uh, it will be my job to, to find enough things to optimize in the upcoming year to then again have enough uh, leap ahead of the demand with the same hardware, or otherwise the hardware got better. But uh, I expect to stand uh, to stay on this hardware for, I think, another two years or so. Okay. Further questions? So why does someone pay for a So just because you mentioned the uh, hardware, just now I was curious what kind of hardware are you using for the server? Um, we are using, uh, for the uh, production units, we are using uh, an SSD of 480 gigabytes. On uh, GZIP, the uh, SSD doesn't play any role at all. Uh, the speed of the SSD on the LZ4 probably does not play a role. I think it's really... Uh, Demand is bigger than uh, the demand. Just uh, makes the server f doesn't make the server full, so there is no limit really attached. And um, I don't know what the processor is. It's um, it's reporting it's that it's having eight cores, but I think it's for real cores and uh, it's doing hyperthreading. It definitely has none of the spectra, however uh, mitigations because it's having non-critical data, and if there's something happening, I could just uh, throw away the, 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 um, the installation and uh, reset up the server. It's a matter of less than a day. <coughs> Essentially, because you're going to <coughs> copy 500 uh, giga, oh, not 500, but 400 gigabytes of data, uh, and um, yeah, yeah, if you ask about the hardware, it's, it's, a SSD, it's a 480 gigabyte SSD. And uh, a known processor was uh, for, uh, for uh, eight cores, including hyperthreading. Thank you. Okay, further questions? Okay, then I thank you for staying here. I'm sorry for the uh, a little bit difficult talk. I've, uh, I have a little